So my title is Chaos and the Theory of Change. And we start this lecture with a question. And the question is, can we predict the future? Now, this is a question that has been asked by many people, not just mathematicians, theologians, people working in the gambling industry, fortune tellers, astrologers, all ask the same question. Can we predict the future? And the answer is, of course, maybe. Okay. Can we tell what's going to happen in the next second? Yes, you're still here. Okay, you haven't run away. Although a second is actually a very, very long time if you're a proton. Okay, so it's hard to predict if you're a proton, but very easy if you're a human being. Can we predict what's going to happen in the next hour? Probably. In the next hour, this building hopefully will still be here and all of you will be alive. Okay, we hope that. If there's anyone that disagrees with me, talk to me after the lecture. Okay. Can we predict what's going to happen in the next year? Some things we can predict very well. I predict that this building will almost certainly be here, and in a year from now, I predict I will be giving the fourth year of my lectures as Gresham Professor of Geometry. But some things we can't predict at all in a year. So I can predict in an hour's time reasonably accurately what the weather will be but I certainly can't predict in a year's time what the weather will be, other than to say it will be autumnal. Okay. So here's a lovely quote from Niels Bohr, a very famous quote. It is hard to predict anything, especially about the future. <laughs> so these are some of the questions I'm going to address in this lecture, and then this feeds into subsequent lectures so that the lecture I will give next month we'll look at the mathematics behind climate change and predictability of the climate. But it's also fair to say that some things are predictable and some things are not. For example, if you live in Scotland, the weather is very predictable. That's winter and that is summer. Apologies to the Scots living uh, in the audience. Well, um, <clears throat> other things can be sort of predictable for a while, and then lose predictability. A famous example would be a camel, where you put straws on the camel, and for a while, everything's nice and predictable, nothing happens, and then at a critical point, you get the famous straw which breaks the camel's back, and then everything changes. And one of the issues about climate change is, have we got to the point of the final straw, and will everything change dramatically? And that's a question I will address a little bit today and a lot in a month's time, assuming we can predict that we'll be here in a month's time. Okay. So these are the sort of questions that we're going to look at. But I'm going to start with a, a somewhat simpler question which feeds into this. And the question is, is the universe itself predictable in the sense of, is there pattern and structure to the universe. So here's the question. Does nature itself have underlying order and pattern? And the answer most definitively is yes. And that's the great scientific kind of hypothesis. Science can be defined, I believe, as the search for order and pattern in the universe. Mathematics can be almost defined as the search for understanding of what patterns you get and how to classify them. I agree that this is a somewhat vague definition, but it will do. So science is the search for order and pattern in the universe, and science works because there is order and pattern out there that we can observe, we can measure, and we can predict. So let's have a look at some examples. Here's one of my favourite examples, snowflakes. Part of my day job is working with the Met Office and helping them predict whether it's going to snow or not. In fact, my particular speciality is ice, but that's closely related. And snowflakes are amazing things. 
They are very small. They're formed when water crystallizes high up in the atmosphere and they have a very predictable shape. In fact, there's an interesting dichotomy that no two snowflakes are the same. Here are eight snowflakes. All of them are different, but every single one of them has a predictable six-fold symmetry. And that's really quite something. And it always amazes me that in something like a snowflake, which is made up of lots and lots of water molecules, which are basically freezing, the, the water molecules over here know exactly what those ones are doing to form the same shape. Okay. There's a lot of very deep science in that, but we can predict very rapid, accurately that a snowflake will have this beautiful symmetric form. And in fact, symmetry is one of the guiding forces behind the pattern that we see in nature. We also see regularity in the animal world. So here we have a honeycomb made up of beautiful hexagons. And the reason we have hexagons is that they fill a lot of space and they are very strong. And this pattern has evolved. Here we have a butterfly which has, again, beautiful patterns with dihedral symmetry and there is pattern and form there. Another area I work in a great deal is the mathematical theory of rock formation. And we see patterns in rock formation. So here are rocks in Cornwall. This is a place called Millock. And what I like about this is the extreme regularity of these what are called chevron patterns. And it's possible mathematically to accurately predict those shapes without actually going anywhere near a rock. You can predict those in advance. We also see, and perhaps most importantly, predictability in the heavens. The dawn of modern science with Kepler and Copernicus, and then later on with Galileo and Newton, was hugely stimulated by the observation that the planets went round the sun in extremely predictable patterns. In fact, if we go back much earlier to the Chinese, they had already observed great regularity in the heavens and were using that predictability to work out when eclipses would occur. It was a bit of an irony that we had a total eclipse of the sun in the UK in 1999. We were able to predict to the second when that eclipse would occur. However, we weren't able to predict that when it did occur, it would be raining heavily and you couldn't see it. <laughs> so that's a bit of an irony. But the actual motion of the planets is very, very, very predictable. Now, one of the first people to realise this was one of my great heroes, and that is Galileo. <coughs> Galileo was born in 1564 on the 15th of February, a date I'm extremely proud of because it is also my birthday. <laughs> I share it with Shackleton as well. And um, I wasn't born in 1564, though, I should say. <laughs> but that is actually around about the same time as Thomas Gresham was born. Um, Thomas Gresham was born 500 years ago from next year, so five, uh, 1519. So same sort of era. And Galileo was a professor in Pisa, and he studied in Pisa and then had a chair there and developed the laws of motion that we now use all the time to understand the mechanics of the world. He also was the first person to point a telescope at the heavens and see all the patterns out there in much more detail than they'd ever been seen before. A truly great man and one of the true modern scientists. But the story I want to talk about occurred not when he was a mathematician, but shortly before he became a mathematician, when he was still a medical student. And he was attending, as everyone had to in those days, mass in the cathedral in Pisa, pictured here, and he saw a chandelier swinging to and fro. This was in 1581, a milestone date in science. 
the, pen, the, the chandelier was swinging to and fro, buffeted by air currents, which was keeping its motion going. Now, I haven't got a chandelier with me today, but I do have a pendulum. So here's a pendulum. I'm sorry I couldn't bring a chandelier with me, but it wouldn't fit in my rucksack. So here's my pendulum. And what Galileo noticed was as the pendulum swung to and fro, it swung in a nice regular way and the swing appeared to take the same time regardless of whether the pendulum had a long swing or a short swing. So if it had a small uh, kind of amplitude, it would still take the same time as if it had a large amplitude. And he, he timed this with his pulse and found it was the same and it didn't matter what day of the week he went or whether it was in the morning or the afternoon, it had this great regularity that it had the same time regardless of the amplitude of the swing. So he found that the swing time was constant regardless of how it was pushed or where it was or when. And the story was that he went back to his student lodgings and experimented into the night with different pendulums that he made and was able to repeatedly test this hypothesis. Very good piece of science. And I like to think that that was why he decided to change from doing medicine and go on to be a scientist. So that's, that was Galileo. Now, he didn't at the time have a theory which explained this. This had to wait for Isaac Newton. So in a rather nice continuum of events, on the year, Galileo was, the year after Galileo was born, New, uh, died, Newton was born. So we have a kind of continuum of brilliant scientists. And Newton was based in Cambridge. And he was based in Trinity College, Cambridge, and was arguably the greatest scientist of all time. There are others as well, but he was arguably uh, the greatest, or at least one of the greatest. And it was at Cambridge that he formulated the laws of motion, the law of gravity, and also developed the theory of calculus, which allowed him to do all the calculations that you needed to be able to solve the equations that he was writing down to explain the world. So Newton wrote down the equations for the motion of the pendulum. And here's our first equation of the, of the day. This is the equation for the pendulum. And what Newton had done was develop the theory of calculus, which was the theory about how things changed. And one of the aspects of that theory was the development of what we call differential equations. A differential equation relates how one thing changes to something else. Newton was well aware of the importance of acceleration. And this is the equation for the angle of the pendulum. This is the acceleration. This is the speed. This is the effect of gravity. And this here is the pendulum equation. So Newton was able to write down the equation for the chandelier that Galileo had looked at about uh, 60 or 70 years before. So this equation is actually quite hard to solve as it looks. The, this term here, the sine theta, is a nonlinear term, which makes it quite hard to solve. And this term here is a model of the air resistance, which also makes it a bit harder. But if you take the assumption that the air resistance is small and the angle of the swing is not too large, then this equation simplifies and then you can solve it. And if you simplify it and solve it, the solution is that the angle, theta, is a number A, which is arbitrary, that's the amplitude, so that could be large or small, times cosine of root G over LT, G being the acceleration due to gravity, L being the length. And that's the equation, the solution. And if you plot that solution, you get this. And that's basically what a pendulum does. So Newton's equation correctly predicted the motion of the pendulum. And another thing that it predicted 
is that the period of the pendulum, capital T, is 2 pi root L over G, and that is independent of the amplitude. So that was in perfect agreement with Galileo's observations. And this equation here became the centerpiece of time-keeping uh, pendulum clocks. So the pendulum clock was invented sometime afterwards by Christian Huygens. And by using this formula, they could predict exactly the swing time of the pendulum, and thus you have a way of telling the time. Just a little mathematical joke. If you do all your calculations in SI units, then the acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 metres per second per second, and the square root of that is almost exactly pi. So that square root is there. That gives you a pi. The pi's cancel, so the time is 2 root L, that means if the length of the ruler is one metre, then the time of a swing, a, two, a whole back and forwards is two seconds, and the time for a swing from one end to the other is almost exactly one second. So I think this is a fluke, but it's a rather nice fluke, that the half swing time of a metre rule is almost exactly one second. And the approximation that pi squared equals g is really very helpful in many calculations. So anyway, that level of predictability allowed us to develop timepieces. But much more importantly than this, Newton, by doing what he did, opened the floodgates for a whole new way of understanding the world. And here's Newton's basic method. The method is... If I want to understand a physical system, I write down the equations which govern it. And these are nearly always differential equations. You then solve the equations. Now, that's not very easy. I, my job is basically to solve the equations, and the fact that they are not easy to solve keeps me in a job. These are the computers that are used by the Met Office to solve the equations for the weather, and for the climate. So there they are. There's an awful lot of them. But once you can solve the equations, like we did for the pendulum, you can then start to predict into the future. So the way we predict the weather is we write down the equations for the weather, we solve those equations, and we solve them 24 hours into the future to allow us to predict the weather 24 hours into the future. So this is Newton's key idea, and that key idea is the basis of pretty well all of modern science and certainly all of modern engineering. Okay, absolutely incredible idea, going back to about 1690, that if you want to predict the future, you write down equations, solve the equations. Does this work? Well, let's give an example where it worked incredibly well. Um, here is Newton's equation for gravity. So this is gravitational uh, acceleration acting on a body by a distant body of mass, capital M. And G here is the gravitational constant. So in the late 18th century, William Herschel, who actually lived in Bath, where I live, pointed his telescope at the heavens and by searching around almost at random made an incredible discovery. He discovered the planet Uranus. Okay. This was a whole new planet. No planet had been discovered up to that point other than the ones known by the ancients. This was a whole new discovery, the planet Uranus. Herschel called the planet George, after King George, but then it got a slightly more serious name. And what they did with Uranus was once they'd, Herschel made his discovery, they looked at its orbit and measured the orbit and started plotting its orbit around the sun. Now, a bit of history. Up to that point, all of the planets, that's Mercury, uh, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, had been plotted. Their motion had been tracked around the sun and found to be in exact agreement, in exact agreement with Newton's laws. 
and therefore you could confidently predict into the future what the planets would do. When they looked at Uranus, they found it almost agreed with Newton's laws, but not quite. So they were faced with two possibilities. One was to ditch Newton's laws, and the other was to say, well, maybe Newton's laws do apply to Uranus, but something is causing the planet Uranus to deviate slightly from its orbit. And they hypothesized that as Uranus was a new planet, maybe there would be another new planet out there which was perturbing Uranus. And uh, two mathematicians, John Couch Adams in Cambridge and Urbain Le Verrier in France, went away and independently calculated where this planet would be. And then a uh, German, uh, German uh, astronomer pointed the telescopes at the right part of the sky and found a whole new planet. And that's the planet Neptune, which was discovered by mathematics. And the point about this in the context of this talk is that the existence and the location of Neptune was predicted. And it was predicted by using Newton's approach of writing down equations and solving equations. And that was an enormous boost to this um, sort of confidence of people trying this approach. As I said, we use exactly this approach now in forecasting the weather up to about a week ahead. I'll talk about why we can't go forward further than that in a minute. And that is based on these things, which are the Navier-Stokes equations for fluid motion. Equations not very different for this are used to forecast climate, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And the success of Newton's program of predicting things led Laplace here to make a quote, which I'll put up, which is now called Laplace's Demon. And here's the quote. We may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future. An intellect, that's the demon, which at a certain moment knows all the forces and where things are, could use Newton's laws um, if its intellect were vast enough to submit these data with analysis, so if they have a decent computer, uh, they could embrace in a single formula the motion of all the bodies in the universe, from the galaxies right down to the individual atoms, and nothing would be uncertain, and the future, like the past, would be present before its eyes. That's some quote. Basically, Laplace is saying, forget free will, there ain't no free will, it's going to happen because it's going to happen. Okay. Once you know what the particles are, they obey Newton's laws, off you go, the future is written for you. Okay. So it's kind of a scary quote. So, that's Laplace's demon. Do we believe that this is true? It seems to be true to a certain extent. We certainly use this approach to predict what galaxies are going to look like, what the solar system does, but does it apply in general? And I would say, quite strongly, it doesn't. If it did, life would look very different from the way it does. Lots of natural and human events don't seem to be predictable. They actually seem to be unpredictable. We have a phrase for this. We say, do you feel lucky? Okay, if I toss a coin, is it going to come down heads or tails? You know, I don't know. Let's have a look at some of the unpredictability that we see around us. So I talked about the weather. If you ask me what tomorrow's weather is going to be, I can tell you pretty well. In five days, it's starting to get a bit woolly. A week, very woolly. Two weeks, forget completely. I love this forecast here. Um, it's almost exactly right that Monday's weather, today we know, yeah, there we are, this is exactly where we are, is essentially a random guess. Okay. Our Weather forecasts seem to start going wrong fairly quickly, despite the power that we throw into them. So the weather after week 
is not particularly predictable. Here's um, a, an example of climate change. So one of the dominant effects on the world's climate in the short term is the El Nino Southern Ocean uh, warming and cooling of the Southern Ocean. I'll talk a bit more about this again next month, but this is an event which drastically affects the economies of the nations in the Pacific and to a certain extent affects the whole world's economy and climate. This is the temperature of the ocean over the last uh, 40 years or so. And the blue shows the coolings, the red shows the warmings. There is a rough four-year periodicity to this. But certainly it will be very hard to make a clear prediction about what's going on here. The El Nino is largely driven by large-scale ocean circulation and there seemed to be just too much going on to give any reliability or prediction other than saying it will probably happen in the next 10 years. Here's a human uh, thing. That wiggly curve is the FT index over the last, well, since 1984. Many economists would love to be able to predict that with precision. I don't think they can. Who would have predicted that, for example? That's the 2008 crash. Brainwaves. These are examples of EEG, scans of the brain, where you have these various types of wave. And look at that. These waves are very, very different from the regular cosine periodic repeatability that we saw for the pendulum. So the human brain probably, fortunately, doesn't look to be particularly predictable. And my favourite example of unpredictability is this chap, which is my dog. Okay. He's a spaniel. Anyone that has a spaniel will understand me when I say it's extremely hard to predict what he's going to do if I let him loose in the woods. Okay. So at a human scale, at an economic scale, and in certain sort of climatic and other areas, the universe seems to be unpredictable. So the question is, how do we square up the fact that I advertised at the beginning of this talk that science is all about finding predictability in nature, that Newton said, I can predict things using maths, with the fact that the world also seems to be unpredictable as well? What is going on? So here's the question, and it's an incredibly deep question. It's a sort of philosophical question. It's a mathematical question. It's possibly even a theological question. Does the complex and unpredictable, nature, unpredictable behavior that we see in nature arise because nature just is like that, so forget it, we can't do any science? Or... Does unpredictability arise naturally in systems where Newton's law is acting? Okay. So this is the fundamental question which I will address today. I'm sorry it's taken me so long to get to it, but this is it. Okay. This is a very, very deep question. It's also linked with a related question, which is, does predictability and unpredictability sort of coexist in the way that we try to understand the universe. And this is what we're going to look at. Now, I didn't bring my dog along, fortunately, and I can't bring the weather along or the climate along, but I have brought a demonstration along which I hope will allow me to illustrate the points that I want to make quite directly. And for this, I need to go back to the pendulum, please. So, this is the pendulum that we swung earlier, and I said was like the chandelier that Galileo looked at in the cathedral in Pisa. But I wasn't being entirely honest with you. This isn't quite the pendulum that Galileo looked at in Pisa. 
This is what we call a double pendulum. So a double pendulum is two pendulums coupled together. There's a bottom bit there, and there's a top bit there. Okay, so there's two bits to this pendulum, and in a sort of mechanical way, it's very like my leg. So there is my knee, and there's the um, hip joint uh, allowing me to couple these two. There's one area this is different from my knee, in that this bit will go all the way round, <laughs> um, which my knee won't do. My elbow did that the other day, and that wasn't good. I was in hospital for a little while as a result. But um, anyway, this is the double pendulum. Now, the double pendulum is a very simple mechanical system. There are two bits to it. There's a bit up here, which has twice the mass of the bit down there. It has what we call four degrees of freedom. The, the top bit has an angle and a velocity. The bottom bit has an angle and a velocity. And it is described exactly by Newton's laws. I'll put up the equations for it in a minute. The weather is just like a pendulum, except you've got a billion degrees of freedom governed by Newton's laws. This has only got four. Now, if I swing it with small swings like that, then it swings to and fro very predictably, just like Galileo thought it would. So that's nice and easy. Uh, if I do it like this, it still swings predictably, but in a different way. I call this out-of-phase motion. So the top bit and the bottom bit are basically going in opposite directions, but still, that's predictable, it's periodic. Okay, let's give it a bit more of a kick now, see what happens, and we'll see what it does. By the way, there's nothing here acting other than gravity. <laughs> and a bit of friction. So eventually this will slow down because the friction acts, but it may take a while. It's got very good bearings, this one. Little uh, bit of history about this pendulum. Um, I have not ever appeared at the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures. However, this pendulum has. Um, this was one of the props which I built for the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures back in 2005, uh, when Marcus de Soto gave a very wonderful series on mathematics. Okay. I get to, at least I've got to keep the prop. So um, let's do this once again, just to show you that really it's not being silly. I'll run out of steam in a minute, and then we'll get to this. Okay, so here we see what appears to be very random and irregular behavior. Okay. If I started this off again, it would do something quite different. If I started it off again, it would do something different again. Okay. The motion here is unpredictable. It's weird things. <laughs> on. I defy you. Do you want to do an experiment on predictability? Sure. What I want you to do, I'll start it swinging, and the bottom it goes to the top bit, and eventually the friction wears it out and it stops. All you have to do is predict when the bottom bit goes to the top bit for the last time. If you can clap when you think it's gone through the bottom bit for the last time, just give me a clap, okay? That's all you have to do. Just try and predict when the bottom bit has finished spinning through the top bit. Let's see how good you are. <laughs> Actually, that one worked rather simply today. I wouldn't, I, I'll know, I don't know, you never know. It seems to be building up energy. Oh, you might have got that one right. Okay. Okay. I think, I think you did well that time. I'll just do another one. Uh, See, it's behaving very differently this time. Yeah. 
By the way, if, if you want, I'm going to bring this next time as well to demonstrate a bit of climate. So you'll get another go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's more like it. <laughs> Okay, if we can uh, bring up the slides then, please. So the double pendulum exhibits three types of motion. The motion is periodic, in phase, that's predictable. It can be periodic out of phase, which is predictable. And it can also be chaotic, and that's unpredictable. So what I've just demonstrated to you is chaos. Um, here's a picture that if you put a light on the end of the pendulum whilst it's in its chaotic phase, and photograph it, that's what it looks like. Incredibly complex and random looking. Now, as I said, this is a system which is governed by Newton's laws, and you can write down equations for this. So the way you write down equations for it is you let the angle of the top bit be theta 1, the angle of the bottom bit theta 2, the length of the bottom bit L2, the length of the top bit L1, the mass is M1 and M2, so there are angles. Um, and that's the equations that you get. They look a little bit daunting, but they're not actually that bad. These are two equations coupled together. They're not like the billion equations that we have for weather forecasting. And these are equations that you can derive by studying the system and applying Newton's laws. And if you look for small swings, just as with the pendulum, then you can solve these equations exactly, and you find you get these predictable periodic motions that we saw. And if you look for large swings, these are too hard to solve analytically. You have to use a computer, but it's not a difficult computer program to write. You find that the computer itself predicts that the motion looks like that. The computer predicts that the motion is unpredictable. Okay. Now, let's slightly expand what we mean by unpredictable in this case. And what we tend to mean by unpredictable in this case is a thing called the butterfly effect. So there was a film that was produced called The Butterfly Effect some time ago. Oh, I haven't told you what chaos is yet. I better tell you what chaos is. So I've told you that the solutions are chaotic. This is probably the most important slide of the whole day, and I almost forgot to tell you it. Chaos is defined by scientists. I don't mean by economists or by politicians or by parents or something else. But chaos means unpredictable and complex and irregular behaviour that comes from a system which is in itself described by simple mathematical equations. So that may not look simple to you, but actually it is. It's only two equations glued together. It's much, much simpler than the weather and infinitely simpler than anything that could remotely describe the brain. Um, chaotic motion is complex, irregular behavior that comes from simple mathematical laws. So linked to this is what I wanted to now say is a thing called the butterfly effect. Now, a film came out a few years ago called The Butterfly Effect, and the premise of this film was that a small change in the past could dramatically affect things in the future. And the reason that this book was called The Butterfly Effect was a guy called Lorentz, who is one of the founders of modern chaos theory, when trying to illustrate what he meant, said that the weather was so sensitive that a butterfly that flaps its wings in Brazil could cause a hurricane in England. Okay. That's called the butterfly effect. We now know that the butterfly would have to have wings about a kilometre across to cause a hurricane in England, but still, the idea is the same. Um, so Lorenz's uh, premise was this, and what he means by that, and this is absolutely the case with the pendulum, is that if I started off in a certain way, it will behave in a certain way, but if I started off very close to that, it will behave ultimately in a very different way. And we call this sensitivity to initial conditions. 
So if you go back, you know, 100 years and stamp on a butterfly, the world will be a different place from what it is now. And that is a definite prediction of the subject of chaos theory, this, um, this irregular behaviour that comes from otherwise seemingly predictable systems. And I regard this, and not everyone would agree with me, as a partial answer to Laplace's demon. So Laplace said, if you knew the positions of the particles, all the particles in the universe, and ran it forward, you could predict the future. The sensitivity to initial conditions and the kind of effects of the chaotic behaviour means that you would have to know those particles exactly, to within, you know, far better than the precision of half the width of an electron. And even if you knew that, at an atomic level, subatomic level, you have randomness built into the fabric of the universe through quantum effects. I discussed this last year in my lecture on the quantum mathematician. And that quantum randomness combined with sensitivity of initial, of initial conditions means that predictability rapidly becomes impossible on the scale that Laplace was imagining. That's not saying that some systems aren't predictable. There we are, the pendulum has now got into a predictable state and eventually it'll come to rest. That's predictable. But large scale predictability on the scale of Laplace just won't happen. Um, if you want to see more examples, here's a lovely one. Go to St Mary Redcliffe Church in Bristol where they have this beautiful water chaotic pendulum. I recommend a trip if you go there. Uh, it's very close to the station so you can walk there very quickly. Um, this is an example from my own, own work. If you have a sort of elliptical or stadium shaped billiard table and you bounce a billiard ball off it obeying the usual rules of reflection, then these are the paths that you get for the billiard ball going around the table. Irregular, unpredictable paths from a completely regular system. Why is this important? Well, if instead of billiard balls you think of radio waves or light rays bouncing around a room, that's roughly what the Wi-Fi is doing in your living room. Okay, and that's one reason it's very hard to predict where you'll get good Wi-Fi and bad Wi-Fi. And that's part of my ongoing research. Short history of chaos. So although we think of chaos as a modern invention, it goes back at least 100 years, or more than that, to this guy, it's called Poincaré, who is one of the giants of French mathematics. And, you know, he's almost on a level with Newton in terms of his ability in mathematics and physics. He was studying a problem that Newton was interested in, which is the motion of three bodies of equal mass around each other. These, this is the sort of motion that you get with three bodies in blue, green, and red. And Poincaré realised that you get extremely irregular motion and essentially the three-body problem is unpredictable. So although we can predict planets going around the sun, the reason we can do that is the sun is very big and the planets are very small. If things are equal sort of masses, they behave like this, and that's what the asteroids do. And I'll tell you why that's important at the end of this talk. Having discovered this, chaos kind of went into sort of limbo for a while, and then it was rediscovered in the 1960s, largely because by that point we had computers that were fast and could solve the sort of equations that we were looking at. So in, in the 1960s, Lorentz, who I've mentioned already, wrote down this set of equations, which are called the Lorentz equations, which are a very, very simplified version of atmospheric convection. So here are his equations for atmospheric convection. He put these on a computer, expecting to see regular behaviour, and was stunned to find that they behaved in a completely irregular way. And this was the modern discovery of chaos, and these equations are a very, very important part of the modern theory of chaos. And that came as a complete surprise, and having discovered that, the floodgates opened and we discovered chaos everywhere. Uh, this is a solution of the Lorentz equations. Uh, in blue and yellow, you have two solutions which differ by five decimal places. Uh, one decimal, well, so 10 to the minus 5. Um, so very, very close to each other. And they, they, they stay close to each other for a while. 
but then start to drift apart. That's the sensitivity to initial conditions. But also, if these are equations in x, y, and z, which represent magnitudes of different convective states, if you plot x and y together, then the chaotic behavior moves around this amazing thing, which is called the Lorentz attractor, where this set has very interesting structure, but at least organizes the irregular behavior. And this is a big difference between chaos and complete randomness. Chaos, you have disorder at some level, but order at other levels. Okay. So that's the Lorentz equations. Um, and then chaos was kind of discovered again in a much simpler system. And this is one I want to quickly take you through uh, as uh, towards the end of this talk. So um, here's um, the problem of being a town planner. A town planner has to try to predict the population of a town 10 years into the future so that you can build schools and stuff like that. And to do this, you have to be able to predict, here's our word predict again, the future population of a town. And the way to do this is to imagine the population in the year n is x, n, and that changes from year to year. And the question the town planner would want to know is if I know the population in the year 2018, can I find the population 2019, 2020, and so on. So one of the first people to look at this was Malthus, and that was about 300 years ago. And Malthus postulated this model that a certain number of people die, a certain number of people are born, so the population next year is a proportion of the population this year, the constant of proportionality being A. If A is 1, the population stays constant, a crown planner's dream, they can confidently predict into the future. If it's greater than 1, the population increases, and if it's less than 1, it decreases. And in general, the population in the year n is A raised to the power n times the population in the year 0. Now, Malthus, when he wrote down the equation, realised that if A was positive, the population would increase and increase and increase, and it would eventually run out of resources, and people would sort of desert the town or die or stuff like that. So this equation then gets modified into a thing we call the logistic map, where the population in the year n plus 1 is A times the population in the year n times this factor here, and this factor is designed to get smaller as the population reaches a threshold limit, saying that you'll run out of resources and then it can't uh, increase. This looks a little bit daunting, so you can rescale it a bit, and you get what's called the classical logistic map. So this is one of the classical descriptions of chaos. Um, it's where you have something you know, xn, that's our population today, Xn plus 1 is the population a year ahead, and R is a number which controls the basically greater growth of the population. This is simple. If you want something to do, you can code that into your pocket calculator or Excel or Python, whichever um, computational device you wish to use. You can even do it on pencil and paper. So what we can do is what the town planner wants to do, which is to start with some population and run it forward in time and see if we can predict the future. And it turns out that the predictability of this model depends on this number r. So if r is 2, for example, if you start with some random start, it doesn't matter what it is, 0.42 in this case, the population increases, decreases for a bit, but then settles down to what we call a fixed point and is very predictable from then on afterwards. Okay, and the town planner would like that. Um, if you take a different number, 3.2, something rather more interesting happens. The, the population bounces between two values. So this is like an economy where you have a boom economy one year, you use up all your resources, so you have a bear economy the next year, you can build up your resources, and you go back to boom again. So you get this boom, bust, boom, bust type behaviour. So a large population depletes the resources, so you get a smaller population and so on. If you increase R a bit more, then you get eight points, where the population oscillates between eight different values, so it's looking a lot more complicated. 
And if you take R to uh, the number four, then this is what this little quadratic equation model does for you. It couldn't be simpler. It's purely quadratic equation gives you the next one. R equals four, that's what you get. This is the irregular behavior, just like that we saw for the pendulum, irregular, unpredictable behavior, which comes from a simple system. Okay. And this is the kind of touchstone of chaos. This, this sort of behavior that we're seeing in this map is mathematically very, very similar to what we were seeing in the pendulum and what we see in many other systems. Um, so there we are. That's chaos. So for those of you who like these sort of things, here's a bit of why this happens. I apologize if you're not mathematical in this regard, but this is a kind of at least a mathematical explanation of what's going on. If you want to look at the case when r equals 4, although it's a complicated system, it's actually possible to solve it exactly. You solve it by making this substitution here. If you substitute this into the equation here, that's our logistic map, then you find that xm plus 1 is this, that's with a bit of trigonometry. That tells you that the angle here is twice the angle of the previous one, and then that ends up being the exact solution of the logistic map when r equals 4. Okay. So that's an exact solution. It's very, very rare you get exact solutions for these things, but in this case you do. And the point about this is that all of chaos is in here. Um, this is our solution. The cosine keeps everything bounded, but the 2 to the n here means that if you have things which are very, very close together to start with, the separation between them doubles and doubles and doubles every time you do the map. And you don't need to double very, very many times before they get completely separated. And so all of chaos from a mathematical point of view, is encapsulated in that equation. And that equation can also be used for the pendulum as well. Um, and here's a, a nice diagram, which kind of explains what's going on to a certain extent. Um, it's saying when r is equal to 2 or lower, this is what the solution is. It's a single fixed point. At 3.2, the solution bounces between two points. This here is called a bifurcation point. It's a point where things change. Um, so the solution becomes slightly less predictable at this point because it goes between two values. There's another point, it goes between four values, it's less predictable. And then at four, it's bouncing between lots of different points and is essentially completely unpredictable. And we use things like these, they're called bifurcation diagrams all the time when we try to understand uh, how complicated systems can go from um, a point of predictability here through these things called bifurcation points, which we try to understand, over to all this complexity here. And in the next lecture, when I talk about chaos, uh, climate, uh, I, I'm going to walk you through some of these sort of diagrams uh, as we go through what we call tipping points, where we try to understand sudden change. Okay. So I'm going to whiz through to points. I'm going to come use back to those next time. So, chaos invented, discovered, rediscovered in the 1960s. Simple systems can have complicated solutions. And the question is, is it, has it got any use? Now, there's a general rule about mathematics, which is that every bit of mathematics has a use. Sometimes it comes more quickly than others, but... Believe me, it can all be used for something. And chaos turns out to be extremely useful. So one of the, the first things it was used for was in computer graphics. So one of the features of chaos is that simple rules can produce complicated shapes. If I want to represent a complicated shape in computer graphics, rather than representing the entire complicated shape, wouldn't it be simpler just to take a simple rule and get the computer to apply that a few times? And this is uh, what's called a fractal fern, which is generated by applying a rule, not in one dimension, but two dimensions, over and over again to produce this wonderful shape. And then you can do that in computer graphics to produce mountains and other uh, things which look like nature. So that's one use. 
Another use is computer art. So one of the other uh, objects which comes into Chaos Theory is called the Mandelbrot set, which relates to the logistic map, which I explained, but looking at complex numbers. And as a result of investigating that set, you get all this beautiful complexity. And this is coming from the logistic map, but just in complex numbers. And there's, for some reason, it's hard to explain, that really looks very, very good. Okay. Um, and there's another example of, of the same sort of thing. Um, in engineering, engineering design, this again is exactly what I do my research in. Uh, the uh, chaos theory has many, many applications. It helps us understand car exhaust patterns, car suspensions, tubes in a boiler, all the way down to improving microwave cookers. If, if you have a microwave cooker which uses a chaotic source for its energy rather than a regular one, you get much more even cooking. So everyone's happy. Okay. So all of these are areas I do my own research in. Um, it also helps us understand nature better so that we can get a much better understanding of the irregularities that we see in turbulence, for example. Over here, we probably don't understand it. About here, we probably do. Um, it arises in things like river deltas. And the example that I showed at the beginning was we predict what the planets are going to do. Poincaré said we don't really know what the asteroids are going to do. And that's actually kind of important because if an asteroid hits us, then the entire humanity civilization ends. Okay. So this is one of the few areas of maths which could actually affect the entirety of human civilization in one go. And certainly we're trying to use chaos theory to better understand how asteroids move, and therefore when we see an asteroid, whether it's going to come anywhere close to us or not. So I've tried to touch in this lecture on whether we can predict things or not into the future, and the limitations of doing that, even if we understand everything else. But there is one thing I definitely can predict, and that's this new understanding of chaos and nature through it, oh, is that chaos is the science of the 21st century. Thank you very much.